Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining. It's so great to see all the kids and with their books. Uh, today I am thrilled. I am the owner of The Thinking Spot. My name is Rima and I am thrilled to welcome our guest of honor, our author, Christina Sunturmat. Hopefully I said your name right. Um, and she is going to talk to us about this program and her book, The Map, Last Map Maker, that hopefully everyone who's joined has had a chance to at least look through. Doing a quick, uh, I think, introduction. Um, like I said, I am Rima from The Thinking Spot, a local bookstore. Uh, Valerie Lockhart here is our partner in crime. She is uh, director of codesavvy.org, which is a local nonprofit that is promoting computer science education among um, everybody, uh, I think, right? Um, and with her help, we have been able to reach uh, a lot of area schools and able to distribute the books. And um, thank you, Christina and um, General Motors and Candlewick Press and American Booksellers Association for the STEM Reads program that is enabling this. With that, uh, take it away, Christina. Thank you so much, Rima. Hello, everyone. Hello. Oh my gosh, this is so exciting. So excited to see you. Raise your hand if you love books. Yay! Raise your hand if you love reading. Yay! Oh, me too. Both hands up. <laughs> All right, so I, I am coming to you today from Austin, Texas. That's where I live. And I'm going to be talking to you about books. I'm going to be talking to you about writing books. I'm going to share with you how I write a book. Okay, you're going to learn everything that I know you're going to know by the time we get done today. All right. And, um, and then at the end, we're going to be doing some questions. So if you have any questions, save them. And when I when I stop presenting, we're going to have a time where you can ask your questions and we'll make sure we get to as many. As All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I have some things to share with you. So yes, my name is Christina Soontornvat and I write lots of different types of books. Okay, so I write picture books. These are books that are mostly illustrations and have some words in them. And I only write the words. So I partner up with illustrators and the illustrators make the beautiful pictures in these books. Um, I also write chapter books. So I have a, a series called Diary of an Ice Princess. Yes. Chapter book series. And these are mostly words with some pictures. I write nonfiction. So nonfiction is true stories. So I have a, a, a nonfiction book called All 13. And this is the true story of the boys soccer team that was trapped inside a cave in Thailand. And it took this international rescue team 18 days to get them out. So this was a true story that I wrote. But my very, very favorite type of book to write is fantasy fiction. Okay, so this is a fantasy is a story with magic in it. Raise your hand if you like stories with magic in them. Yes. Okay, great. So I have a fantasy novel that's called A Wish in the Dark. And this novel got an, a Newbery Honor Award last year. And the book that I'm here to talk to you about today is one of my favorite books that I've ever written. It's called The Last Map Maker. There, it is a fantasy, so there is magic. There are magical creatures. There are dragons in this story, okay? And I'm gonna tell you all about it, but first I want to talk to you more, tell you more about me, okay? You need to get to know me. And that means you need to see some embarrassing pictures of me, okay? Are you okay with that? <laughs> so here, this is me. I think this is me in the first grade. <laughs> and, um, and this is me in the fourth grade. I kind of have the same haircut as I had in the fourth grade. I have the same bangs, okay? Um, so I, I have to tell you about my family because my family is super important to me and they show up in all of the books that I write. So my dad is an immigrant. He immigrated from Thailand to the United States when he was 19. 
2019. And he met my mom in Texas. And I was born here in Texas and have lived in Texas my whole life. So when I was growing up, I would go visit my grandparents who lived on their farm in Texas. I would go every summer. And then I would also go visit my grandparents who lived in Thailand. So we would, you know, we would save up and every few years we would go visit them in, in their house in Bangkok, Thailand. So that, you know, my grandparents and their stories and my parents and my parents' stories, all of that was just really something that was a big part of my childhood and is something that I think made me be an author. But when I was your age, I had no idea that I was gonna grow up to be an author. For one thing, I never met an author before. Like I, when I was a kid, I never met an author, which is why this is so cool and why I'm so grateful to The Thinking Spot and to Valerie for putting us together because you get to meet me today and you get to see that I'm just like a regular person. And if I could be an author, you could be an author, right? So when I was, when I was a kid, I loved to read books. And I, my favorite types of books were fantasy and adventure stories, okay? So like all the books that you see on screen today are some of the books that I love. Maybe Miss Reen books in her store. But, but when I was a kid in elementary school, way, way back in the ancient times called the 1980s, okay? <laughs> we, we didn't have all these amazing books. So, you know, the, the stuff that I had to read in my library was much more limited. Um, and so I didn't have a lot of diverse books. I didn't see my kids that look like me in the stories. Um, these were some of my favorite books when I was a kid. These were four of my very, very favorites. And I loved these books so much. But when I turned the book cover on the back and looked at, you know, who are the people who are writing these stories? Oh, well, they were all they were all British. They were from England and they were very proper and they had, you know, they had uh, gone to like Oxford University. They seemed very fancy to me. Right. And it was really hard to imagine myself as one of these fancy people <laughs> who would write books. It just seemed like, you know, they were very far away and, and mysterious. And I sort of got the impression that if you were gonna write a fantasy story, you know, all the fantasy stories I read were kind of the same. It was like, you know, an elven warrior riding into battle on his beautiful white horse, but I was more like this, okay? This was me. <laughs> so it was hard to think about like, what kind of story would I write? What, what would I write about? Um, this horse has bangs, just like, just like I have bangs, okay? This is a theme, a theme of this talk. <laughs> um, so, you know, another reason why I didn't think about being an author is when I was a kid, I got it, I, I had a mistake in my thinking, okay? I thought that you had to choose what you were going to do and you couldn't do more than one thing as a grown up. So I thought that you would either choose to be a writer or maybe if you were into history, you would choose to do that. Or maybe if you were an artist, you would choose to do art. Or if you like science and math, technology and engineering, we call that STEM, you would choose to do that. So when when I was a kid, I really loved science and math. Raise your hand if you like to do math and science at your school. Awesome. Oh my gosh, I love to see that. So I thought, okay, well, that's my thing and that's the thing that I'm going to do. And so even though I loved making up stories and I loved books, I sort of stopped doing that for a while and I, I followed my love for STEM. Okay, so when I went to college, I studied mechanical engineering. So I became an engineer and the thing that I did with that that job is I uh, with that degree, my first job was I worked in a science museum. So I worked in a museum for 10 years and I made science exhibits and I got kids excited about science and it was really great, a really great job. But it wasn't until I was a grown up. I was 30 years old. OK, very old. All right. I know for kids that's like ancient. Um, I started remembering how much I love stories and how much I loved books and writing. And so I came up with an idea for a story 
It took me six years to write my first book, to turn that story into my first book. But once I, I published my first book, I could not stop. I just wrote so many, 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 many more books. So I have 17 books that are out now and I have more that are coming on the way. So the one that we're gonna talk about today is this one, The Last Map Maker. This is one of my favorites. It was also maybe the hardest book I ever wrote because I rewrote it so many times. And now remember, when I went to college, I didn't study to be a writer. I studied to be an engineer. So all of the things that I learned about writing a fantasy story, I kind of had to teach myself. Um, and so that's what I'm going to share with you today. Okay, so today you are going to learn how to write a great fantasy novel, or at least you're going to learn how to get started. Okay, does that sound good? Okay, so the very first thing when I'm writing a story is I think about a character. I think about who is this story going to be about, because that's what makes me fall in love with the story is a great character. And the thing that makes a character great is that they have things that they want, like a goal, they're gonna go for it, but they also have something inside of them that they have to figure out, okay? So let me give you an example. I'm gonna tell you about the main character of The Last Map Maker, all right? So she's a 12-year-old girl, her name is Sai, and she's an apprentice or like an assistant to a map maker. So he is the most famous map maker in their whole kingdom. So Sai goes to work every morning. She has a great job. She, you know, she acts like she's got a great home life. She acts like she has it all together, like she's going to go off to school. She's going to go to college. But actually, the true the truth is that she doesn't have it all together she doesn't have all of that going on so she's hiding a big secret from the man that she's working for. So actually she she lives with her dad and her dad is a con man so he's always trying to like come up with schemes to make money and he breaks the rules he breaks the law to do that and he's always trying to get Sai to help him do that. So Sai, more than anything, if she could have any wish in the world, she would wish to just run away from all that. She wants to hide from who she is. She wants to pretend that her dad doesn't exist and just get away from it. So what Sai needs in her heart and what she's gonna be trying to figure out through the whole story is that the past, the what she was before, like she can't control what's already happened. She can't control what her dad has done. She can't control any of that, but she can control her future and what she does next. That's in her control, okay? So you see, she has something she wants, and something she needs inside. All right, so we have our character, right? The next thing that you have to do in your story when you're writing a fantasy story is you have to decide where does this story take place? What's the setting of the story? In, in writing books, we call that world building. Okay, so you build the whole world. So you decide, does this book take place in the past? Does it take place in the future? Is it underwater? Is it in a magical kingdom? What, what is up with this story? So in The Last Map Maker, Sai lives in a kingdom that's an island kingdom, okay? So her kingdom is made up of different islands. And because it's an island kingdom, everyone who lives there has something to do with ships, okay? So maybe like people are, their job is to build the ships or maybe they're sailors or maybe they, they um, like her, her employer is a map maker. He, go, he sails on ships and he makes maps that captains can use, okay? Now, um, the other thing that I decided about this world is that I wanted it, the world to feel like Thailand, which is where my family is from, was where my dad and my grandparents are from. So when I was thinking about what's the food going to be like, what's the clothing going to be like, what are the customs, what's the, the religion, like do people go to temple or do they go to a church? I decided that was going to feel a lot like Thailand, kind of like a magical Thailand, all right? And the other thing about the world that I decided is that there's something wrong with this world, okay? So in this world, in this kingdom, everyone is very concerned about your status. So like, 
Who is your family? What is your last name? How many connections do you have? How many ancestors do you have? What kind of jewelry do you wear? What kind of clothes do you wear? What kind of house do you have? That's all very important. And of course, Sai doesn't have any of that. She doesn't have any connections. She doesn't have like a famous family. She doesn't have an important last name. She's just really, she's kind of like on her own, okay? So right away, she kind of doesn't fit in this world. The other thing about the world that I decided I wanted to have is that this kingdom that Sai lives in, they have just fought a war and they have won. And so what they're doing is they're like building an empire. So what that means is that they're sending out ships all over the world and they're going to find, they're going to discover new lands and they're going to like kind of capture them and make them a part of their empire all right does this sound like anything that has ever happened in history has there ever been empires in history yes right absolutely so one of the things that i was reading about before i started working on this book is i was reading about the history of the british empire so this is queen victoria she was the queen of england and in the time that she was queen, the British Empire grew so big that it owned places on every single continent in the world. So this is a map in every, that shows everything in red is something that the British Empire owned. Now, when, when the British Empire sent out ships to these countries and, and claimed that they discovered them, were there already people living there? Yes, there were already people living there, right? So like these places had already been discovered and, and the British Empire just decided they were going to take them and make them a part of their empire, which was a t terrible thing. It caused a lot of destruction all over the world. So I, this is something that was like influencing me while I was writing my story, this history, okay? So I decided that in Sai's kingdom, it's actually a queendom, okay, because there's a queen, the queen has issued a royal proclamation and she says that any ship that goes out and makes a map of a new continent of an undiscovered continent and comes back with the map will be rich they're going to get a prize they're going to get a lot of money and they're going to everyone who's involved is going to be famous okay so this like kind of sets the stage for size adventures all right so you've got the character, you have the world. When you're writing fantasy, the best thing about fantasy is, is there's magic, right? So you have to decide what is the magic going to be. And the best magical stories have magic that feel like science. And so what, what I mean by that is like, your magic has to have rules. It has to like, it can't just be like you just make it up and change it constantly. So like if you watch a Marvel movie, you know, the the superpowers that the Marvel heroes have, they each have their own power and it's very rule based like Iron Man. His power comes from his suit, right? This thing that's inside of his heart. Um, Spider-Man, he has to have these webs and like there's a very specific story of how Spider-Man got his powers and it's not like they can do everything, right? There's rules. So, um, so let me give you an example from the last map maker. So this book, there's so much about map making. So I had to research, I had to learn what is the science of making a map? How do you make, how do you make a map of a place? How did people used to do it? So now our maps, like if you use Google maps, they're so accurate because we have so much technology that goes into making these maps. We use satellites, we use drones, you, you know, Google maps has a car that goes around and takes pictures, like a lot of technology. But hundreds of years ago, if you wanted to make a map, your tools were really, really limited. You just had like a telescope, you'd have a compass, you'd have, you know, some things to measure angles and distances, but that was it. And so that meant that the maps of a long time ago, they, they were not necessarily accurate. So let me show you what I'm talking about. This is one of the oldest maps we have of the world, okay? This map is 600 years old, 
And this is, it was made by an Italian map maker. And this is what they thought the world looked like. At the time, this was like the most accurate map ever made. So does this look familiar to you? Does this look like the world to you? Not, not really, right? Okay, let me flip it upside down. I'm gonna flip it upside down. Does this look familiar to you at all? Does it look like anything you recognize? Yeah? Okay, what if I told you this over here is Europe? Does that look like Europe to you? How about this over here is Asia? And this over here is supposed to be Africa. Okay, I can see, I can see some things. Okay, I see Europe, definitely. Like the, the guy who made it is from Italy. So like Italy looks like Italy. <laughs> But I don't know if he ever went to Asia. I don't see India anywhere on that map. I'm not sure it's there. I can't figure out where it is. And then Africa, it kind of looks like he just really wanted it to fit inside a circle. And so he drew it that way, right? <laughs> so not super accurate, right? But is this? these are the things that you learn when you start doing the research for your book. Um, the th but the thing I love most about looking at old maps is like all of the cool pictures that you see that are decorating the old maps. So if you look at these ancient maps, they on the border, a lot of times they will draw dragons. And this, I just love this so much. So the map makers, especially in places that were dangerous for a ship to go, they would draw a dragon or they would say, here are dragons. And what that basically meant was, don't go there. Like don't sail your ship there because it's, it's scary. It's dangerous for you. And so I thought, okay, in the last map maker, what if the ship that's, that Sai is going to travel on, that's going to go out and try to discover this unknown continent, what if it's going to a place that has real dragons, okay? So real dragons that are prowling the waters and protecting their homeland. Now, dragons are a part of Thai culture. If you go to Thailand, you see dragons a lot. And these are water dragons. So the Asian dragons are often water dragons and they're called Naga. So this, you know, like if you've seen Raya and the Last Dragon, that, that's an Asian style dragon or Spirited Away, that's, an, that's another, uh, another water dragon. Um, and so I thought, okay, this is gonna be a real part of the story. Like in Sai's kingdom, a dragon is gonna be on the flag. It's gonna be like an important symbol for the book. And then there's gonna be a real dragon in the book. And I wanted it to feel real, like a real creature. So I researched living dragons that we have on earth today, okay? This is a real living dragon that exists today on earth. And it's about this big. Okay, <laughs> it's a it's a lizard. It's an earless monitor lizard. But doesn't that look ferocious? Imagine if it was like 100 feet long, you would be terrified of this thing, right? Now, here's the cool thing that I found out about lizards and all reptiles and all birds and some mammals is they have this amazing thing, adaptation on their eye. So they have a third eyelid, okay? They have an upper eyelid and a lower eyelid, just like us, but they have this third eyelid that is clear and it will slide over their eyeball to protect their eyeball. Let me show you a video because it's amazing, all right? So this is a crocodile and the, the third eyelid of a crocodile. They also call it the nictitating membrane. Did you see that? Did you see that third eyelid? Here's gonna go in slow motion. Boom! the third eyelid it's incredible let me see one more time such a cool adaptation right and do you know that pink gooey thing in the corner of your eye have you ever noticed that that pink gooey thing that's uh humans that's what's left over of our third eyelid so we used to have a third eyelid we don't have one anymore and that's all that we have left so i thought okay size map maker the man that she works for he has this eyeglass that he uses to make his maps and he looks through it all the time, right? And I thought, okay, what if that eyeglass was made from the third eyelid of a dragon, all right? Now, if it comes from the third eyelid of a dragon, it's gotta be magical. So what is the magical power gonna be that he has? I think it's to see the truth. 
So when a dragon looks at you through its third eyelid, it sees you for who you really are. And when the map maker looks through this glass, he can tell if you're telling the truth or not. All right, so there, that's, that's gonna be the part of the magic for the story. Okay, so you've got, we've got our character, we have our world, we know what the magic is, we have to get the story started. So I always tell myself, okay, what kicks off the adventure? The adventure begins when? And so the adventure for Sai begins when she gets asked to go on this expedition. So everything for her life was normal until her map maker decides to join an expedition that's trying to make a map of a mysterious continent. And Sai gets to go with him. This is her chance to get what she wanted, right? What did she want? She wanted to, to hide from her past. She wanted to make a new life for herself. If they make a map of this place, they're gonna be rich, they're gonna be famous, but they would also be a part of this empire that's doing bad things, right? So Sai's gonna have to make a choice. What's she gonna do? Is she gonna go for her what she wanted or is she gonna do the right thing, okay? So you, to find out, you have to read the book. <laughs> so now the last thing I wanna tell you is I really hope that what you saw from everything that I'm telling you about this book is that there's not these separate boxes. Like think about all of the things that I used to write The Last Map Maker. I, I, was, I was writing a story, right? But I also, I used history. I used stuff from history. I, I looked at art to make the story. I used my science, my love for science. That definitely was a part of the book. And I also, I used my family stories too. Like my, my, my family, my culture and my heritage was a huge part of making this book. So it's really, it's not about putting yourself in a box, okay? It's just, it's all one box. Or actually, let's, I think we should just think about like blowing up the boxes. There's no box. Don't let anyone put you in a box, all right? And don't put yourself in a box. Whatever you end up doing, you're going to use all the different parts of your brain, all your different passions, okay? Does that sound good? Yes? <laughs> okay. All right. I think this is a perfect time to stop and we'll do some questions, all right? All right. So let's see. Okay. Miss Valerie, what's the best way to do questions? Do we want to call on the class and we could have them ask their question or do you want them to type it into the chat you've done this before so you would tell me what you uh, like. it might be easier for for some maybe the teacher to type the questions in from the kids uh because it might be a little bit easier to filter them that way so okay. if if there are questions maybe we can type them in and then christina can ask or can read them or we can read them off to you either way perfect and you can also type in the name of the of the child who asks. Okay, yep. so we have a question from Ariel in Miss Phelan's class. What inspired you to become a writer? You know, I just, I love telling stories so much. Like, could you tell from that presentation that I just like get really into telling stories? Like, I love books, I love movies, I love any time, like I, I tell my kids bedtime stories. I love doing anything like that. And so being a writer lets me like think of new stories all the time and create them and, and put them down on paper. So being a writer, it really feels like I'm doing what I'm supposed to do using all the parts of my brain. Such a great question, Ariel. Thank you for that. <laughs> and oh, Rima, you have a thinking spot book club and they're asking how long did it take to write this book? Okay, um, this book, do you, I don't know if you remember, but at the beginning I said this is the hardest book that I ever wrote. All right, and Miss Allison, you also have the same question. How long did it take you to write The Last Map Maker? Um, this, I started writing this seven years ago. Was it seven years ago? Yes, seven years ago. And I finished the book. It took me about a year to write the book. I finished it. I thought it was amazing. I tried to send it out to publishers to get it published and nobody would publish the book. They just, nobody liked it at that time. I don't know why, but like I got rejected so many times from so many publishers. So I put the book away 
And I thought, well, maybe this is just, you know, it's just going to be a story I wrote that never gets published. And then a couple years ago, I started working with a new editor and she was like, well, what do you, what book do you want to write next? What, what do you want to work on? And I was like, you know, I just really want to make the last map maker work. Like I want to make it happen for this book. So we went back to it and I rewrote the whole thing. I changed so much in the book and, and it, it, I made it a lot stronger. I made it a lot better. And so then I finally, finally got it published seven years after I started working on it. So sometimes it takes a really long time and sometimes you have to just not give up on an idea and, and, you know, try to think of like, okay, how can I know I can make this work? How can I? Okay. Let's see. Um, I had a question from Miss Phelan's class. Um, why do you like fantasy so much? Oh, great question. Thank you. And that question was from dragon. I love that. Um, so when I was little, I lived in a really small town in Texas, and I, I, just, I just always was looking for something that was magic. Like if there was ever a door in my school that nobody ever opened, I would be like, there's a giant that lives behind that door and that's why they don't open it. I was just like, always like, what, what could be magical? You know, like, is, am I about to find like a magic pebble that I can make a wish on? Um, I think I just wanted something exciting to happen in my life and fantasy books were, were where, where the excitement was. It just kind of like took me out of the real world while I was reading them. So I've always, always loved them. All right, let's see. Um, Miss Phelan's class says there's a question from Sue Days. Um, I, I don't know if I said that right. I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. Who is your favorite author? Okay, this is very hard because I'm I'm friends with a lot of authors and I love so many different types of authors. So it's really hard for me to say. I will just tell you some of my favorite authors right now that I've been reading them lately. So one of my favorite books is by Erin Entrada Kelly, and it's called Those Kids from Fawn Creek. I love that book. It's about kids who live in a really small town. There is a new book out by Jasmine Warga, and it's called A Rover Story, and it's about a Mars rover. The, the, a robot tells the story, and it's so, so great. Um, my kids recently were reading The Marvelers, which is a new book by Danielle Clayton. It's a magic school, a book that's about a magic school, which I love any book that's about a magic school, okay? If you tell me you've got a magic school book, I'm going to love it automatically, but this one is really, really great. Um, so those are just some of my favorites. I could never say a oh, favorite. Okay, um, uh, in Nora in Miss Phelan's class asks, do you know any other famous authors and or scientists? So here's a cool Sorry, thing. That's, um, Na Naima, I apologize. I missed oh, Naima, not Nora. Okay, thanks. Was that autocorrect? Because that does that to me all the time and it's so annoying. Uh, <laughs> I have a Nora too. I just have Oh, you have a Nora. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Sorry. Got it. Naima and Nora, thank you both. Okay. Um, Naima, do I know any other famous authors? Th th here's a cool thing about becoming a published author is that I have met a lot of other authors. So I actually, especially during the pandemic, me and my author friends would get on, we, we created a text group and we check in with each other every single day and ask how we're doing and what we're working on. So like, um, uh, Stuart Gibbs, Sarah Lenofsky, Gordon Corman, Karina Yan Glazer. These are all authors that are on my text thread and, and we check in with each other all the time, which has been really fun. And they're all totally normal people. And they like, you know, they're goofy and ridiculous. So nobody is fancy. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Let's go to um, Ms. Radaj's class. I hope I said this right. Um, oh, Mr. Christensen's fifth grade class asked, what was the hardest part of making a book? Um, okay, so for me, the hardest part is when I'm writing the first draft, because the first draft, you know, you, it could be anything. Like, like, does anybody out there ever get writer's block? Have you ever had writer's block before? So I get writer's block when I just, 
I, I have no direction. I just like, it could be whatever in the world, like the, the page is blank and I have to come up with what, what happens next. And I think a lot of times the reason I get off writer's block is because I'm like not confident. I'm like second guessing myself. I'm like, oh, this is a dumb idea. This doesn't work. This is not funny, blah, blah, blah. So I have to like turn that part off in my brain so that I can keep going. So I would say that doubting, doubting myself is the hardest part. Christina, um, there was one that we kind of skipped over. Uh, Miss Thompson's third grade class is wondering who illustrated the cover. How long did that take and how did you work together? Oh, great question. I'm so glad you asked that. So the cover illustrator, her name is Christina Chung. So two Christinas. <laughs> Um, and it's so beautiful. She she illustrates lots of she illustrates other books too. And um, how long did it take? I'm not sure how long it took her. A few months at least. And we this is the crazy thing. Authors do not design their book covers. So I didn't tell her like, oh, I want Sai to be on the ship with the waves and the thing in the back and the and the birds and the I want it to be pink and blah blah blah. I didn't do any of that. She just drew this after she read the book. And I was like, oh, I love it. And I, I did have like a few things that I wanted to tell her, like the dragon in the back here. Um, I don't know if that was there for, at first. And I said, do you think you, that you could figure out how to get a dragon in there? Um, because that's a huge part of the story. And so she's the one who figured out how to make it part of the sun. And there were other little things like, um, like Sai is holding a map here. And I don't think that she was doing that at first. And we were like, oh, could she be holding this map? Because actually this map right here is very important to the story. It comes back in later. So it's just little things that I, I asked her for, but really she did the whole thing by herself, which is amazing. All right, Valerie, you're keeping, keeping track. Do you wanna, you, you tell me questions. All right, uh, the next one is from Rayon in Miss Phelan's class. Are you going to add your book to the St. Paul Public Library's bookmobile? Oh, you know what? I didn't even know that you had a bookmobile in for in St. Paul. Well, we can I've... definitely see how, how to make that happen. <laughs> oh, yes, I would love that so much. I mean, definitely it's in it's in the library. I know it would be in the public library because it's in most libraries. So, but I mean, on the bookmobile, I would love that more than anything. That would be so great. Uh, let's see, the Thinking Spot Book Club had a question. What are the other science parts in the book? Okay, yes, there's actually, there's a lot. So the book takes place on a ship. So I had to learn how a ship works. <laughs> So I, I had to research like um, how how are sailing ships built? What are they made of? How tall are the masts? When you are sailing, you know, you don't have a motor. You're not like you don't like turn on an engine. You're using the wind to 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 push you along. Right. And so there's so much science that goes into you know what what way do you put the sails up if you put all the sails up at once that's going to catch a lot of wind and you could go really fast but if the wind is too strong the the mast which is the wooden piece that holds the sails it can put so much force on it that it will actually break and then you would be in really big trouble right like your whole ship could could crack could like sink if that happens so there was just like all of these things to think about like okay if i'm gonna have sai climb up the mast how high is that what would she see from there how far can you see on the ocean like how many can you see like a mile across the ocean when you're that up high like just all of this stuff that i had to research that was really fun because I was telling the story. Good question. Awesome. Uh, Peter in Miss Phelan's class says, do you like nonfiction? I do like nonfiction. Peter, do you like nonfiction? I wonder if you ask that, you must. Peter, do you like nonfiction? Yes. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I, I love nonfiction. I mean, I especially I really like stories 
nonfiction books that are like they tell the story like it's a novel. So that's what I tried to do with all 13. I was like trying to tell the story like it was an adventure story because it is so exciting, um, but it's all true. So I, I mean, there's just so much fascinating stuff in this world. Nonfiction is so great. Great question. Uh, let's see, AJ from Miss Phelan's class. Why did you make an island kingdom in the last map maker? Oh, I love that question. So um, I, I knew this book was going to take place on a ship. I really wanted that to be a part of it. And so I thought, okay, you know, if you live in an island kingdom, the ocean is a huge part of your life. So everyone in the kingdom would have something to do with the ocean. They would be fishermen, they would be, you know, they would be sailors, they would be working on the ships. Um, it just it just like really made sense to me. And then also um, uh, I, I made it a part of the, the kingdom's history that it used to be a, a, an, a kingdom of dragons. So the dragons used to live in Sai's kingdom, but then when it grew and became bigger and more powerful, the dragons all kind of swam away because they don't like to be around people. And so that's sort of another reason why it made sense to make it islands. I love that question. Thank you. <laughs> ben from Miss Allison's class says, what are you currently working on? Oh my gosh, I'm currently working on so many books. <laughs> I'm working on a nonfiction book. I'm working on a, I'm working on a graphic novel. So I have a graphic novel that just came out. I don't have it. I only have the cover for it <laughs> printed out. Um, so it's called The Tryout. And this is a true story of when I tried out for cheerleader in the seventh grade. So this book is already out. And it's it's been out for like a month, I think. And I'm working on a sequel. So there's so this takes place in the seventh grade, and my next book takes place in the eighth grade. So if you like graphic novels, you might like that book too. It's very I'm sure exciting. no one likes graphic novels. Who likes graphic novels? Just kidding. Everybody likes graphic novels. Yeah, you're like, yay, yeah, me. <laughs> Uh, let's see, what was it like the first time you saw your book in a library or bookstore? Oh my gosh, I just couldn't believe it. I could not believe, I, I just, you know, um, so when I was young and like all my life, my last name, I used to get teased for it. Like people would tease me for, my last name is Soon Torn Bot and they would call me like Soon Torn Snot they would like, you know, make fun of how long it is or how hard it is to say, but I kept my last name. And, and I remember when my first book was published, this is not my first, oh wait, where is my first book? That is my first book, but I'll show you. When you publish a book and you turn it on the side and you see it, you get the title of the book and you get your name on the spine. And so to see my last name there after so many years of like people teasing me for it, I was like, oh my gosh, that just, it felt amazing. It felt really amazing. <laughs> Good question. Uh, let's see, from Eamon in Miss Allison's class, do you miss engineering? Oh, you know what? I, I just, I really feel like I am doing engineering when I'm writing, you know, engineering is like problem solving. That's when I was an engineer, that's basically what I did. You, you get a problem, you have a team and you have to figure out how to solve the problem. You, you know, you have a few tools, you have a deadline, make it happen. And that's exactly what I feel like it's like making a book is you, you have to solve a problem, but the problem is the story. So I would say that the thing that I miss about engineering is that I always worked on a team. Like I worked with people in real life. Like we would like work on it together and like work, you know, solve stuff together. And I don't do that as much. I, I'm, I'm more working by myself. So sometimes I miss working with other people. I like talk to myself a lot. <laughs> Uh, Joshua in Miss Allison's class is wondering what your process was for writing all 13. Oh, all 13. The, that was super different. Uh, that was my first, um, my first nonfiction. And so for that one, most of the research that I did, I did interviews for it. So all, so all 13, that's, that story took place in Thailand. 
So it was a, a rescue that happened in a cave in Thailand. So I went to Thailand to interview people and my dad went with me and he helped me translate. He helped me talk, talk to the people that I was interviewing. And, um, and so I collected like hours and hours of interviews and then had to figure out like, okay, how am I going to lay out this story? What am I going to include? Um, su super, a lot of research, way more research than any other book I've ever written. Great question. Uh, let's see. Eleanor said, we, we saw a tryout at our book fair last week. How is it different to make a graphic novel? Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's so different. Oh, that's so exciting that it was at the book fair. Um, so it, it's really different because the artist, the so the artist for the tryout, her name is Joanna Kakeo, and she does so much of the work. So I write the words, like I describe you know, what's gonna happen in every scene. So I'm like, okay, Christina is about to try out for cheerleader. She's feeling really nervous. She looks down at her hands and her hands are sweating. Um, so I have to write up all of those things and lay it all out. And then she goes and she draws all the pictures. So sort of like with the cover artist where they just come up with the pictures based on your words. And then I go back and I tell her, Oh my gosh, this is so wonderful. But what about, you know, you forgot to draw her backpack. She had a backpack on in the first scene, but where did her backpack go? So make sure she has her backpack on. Stuff like that. So we go back and forth a lot with the artist. It's so hard. It, it was way harder than I thought. <laughs> and I'm doing another one now. So many details. So much. Be, yeah. Uh, Mimi in Miss Allison's class wonders, do you like scary books? Oh my gosh. Okay, Mimi, do you like scary books? Mimi, where are you? Do you like scary books? Go ahead. Yes, I do like scary books. <laughs> yes, she loves scary books. You know what? I feel like kids can re can handle scary. I, why is that? I I honestly i really cannot read scary books because i think i read book i read books at night usually when i'm in bed and if i get all hyped up and scared i cannot sleep like i just think about them and then i'm like i really have to go to the bathroom but i am not getting out of this bed <laughs> so um i i do like putting like creepy frightening stuff in books but really scary like horror stories i don't i can't do although let me tell you that trying out for cheerleader was kind of a horror story <laughs> it was scary <laughs> that would that would be very scary uh kenna in miss feelings class is wondering why you didn't make the last map maker a graphic novel yeah, I don't know why I need to do that. <laughs> you know, a lot of authors are turning their novels into graphic novels. And I have thought about asking Candlewick, asking my publisher if they want to do a graphic novel of like A Wish in the Dark or The, La or the Last Mapmaker. If that would take a lot of time to think about how to lay it all out. But I would love to do that. So why not? Kenna, let's do it. Let's make it happen. Love it. Uh, last question we have, uh, we think about design, the design process as engineering at our school. I think making a book has a lot of design process in it. Oh my gosh, yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, that that's why I talk about like, don't think about like everything as being separate. Like writing a book is so much more like engineering than I think people know. Engineering is so much like being artistic and being creative. There's so much of that that goes into it than people know. So it's like, you know, we we kind of like, we take math class, we take science class, we take writing class, and everything gets separated to make it easy when you're in school. But really in the real world, it's like all together, all the time. Like Miss Valerie, you are you do coding, you studied coding, computer science, and like you're talking with people all the time, you're problem solving all the time, you're a creative person. So it's everything, everything is everything. We all have to know how to do, have, have a little bit of everything to yeah. mix it all together. Yeah. Oh my gosh, such wonderful questions, everyone. Thank you so much. I, I hope you enjoyed it and I really hope you like the book and I hope I get to see you sometime in person in real life. This was wonderful. Thanks everyone for joining and a big thank you and a show clap of hands for Christina. Yay!
Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Thinking Spot. Thank you, Miss Valerie. See you soon. <laughs>